Hey baby, are you really a doctor? Yeah, I have a PhD. Can I see it? You can hear about it. When do you want to get together? How about Thursday at noon? How about every Thursday at noon on CFUV? You want other people to hear us? I want everyone to hear us. Welcome to the first ever episode of First Person Plural. Each week we are going to address a specific topic with a sociological eye. We hope to introduce you to a way of thinking that recognizes the ways in which we live in the world together. We begin this journey by posing a simple question. Who is in control of your life? This question has been answered by philosophers, theologians, politicians, and over the past two centuries or so, a breed of scholars who call themselves sociologists. Georg Zimmel, in 1922, wrote about the ways in which people create groups with each other in Die Kreuzung Sozialer Kreis, literally translated into English as Intersection of Social Circles. Reinhard Bendix, in his 1950 translation of Zimmel's work, felt that social circles was too vague a term and thus entitled it the web of group affiliations. The question of how the individual and society create each other was addressed in Zimmel's text. The development of the public mind shows itself by the fact that a sufficient number of groups is present which have form and organization. Their number is sufficient in the sense that they give an individual of many gifts the opportunity to pursue each of his interests in association with others. Such multiplicity of groups implies that the ideals of collectivism and of individualism are approximated to the same extent. On the one hand, the individual finds a community for each of his inclinations and strivings, which makes it easier to satisfy them. This community provides an organizational form for his activities, and it offers in this way all the advantages of group membership as well as of organizational experience. On the other hand, the specific qualities of the individual are preserved through the combination of groups which can be a different combination in each case. Thus one can say that society arises from the individual and that the individual arises out of association. An advanced culture broadens more and more the social groups to which we belong with our whole personality but at the same time the individual is made to rely on his own resources to a greater extent, and he is deprived of many supports and advantages associated with the tightly knit primary group. Thus, the creation of groups and associations in which any number of people can come together on the basis of their interest in a common purpose compensates for that isolation of the personality which develops out of breaking away from the narrow confines of earlier circumstances. Zimmel seems to be answering the question that we control our lives by the ways in which we choose our social circles, but then our social circles help shape who we are. We posed the question, who is in control of your life and how do you know this, to a number of people in Victoria. We greatly appreciate those who took the time to answer this question for our broadcast. Even though most said they were in some control of their lives, we heard a range of answers. There were those who said unequivocally that they were in control. I am. Well, I make it so. Yes. I am. Because I make all the decisions affecting my life. There were those who said they were in control but showed some hesitation. I am. How did I come to feel that way? I just know that I am. Well, if I'm not in control of it, it would be. Me. I like no one. Because I can make my own choices. I think I'm a mature person who's well informed enough about what's going on in the world and where I am in the world, and I can make my own choices. I think for the most part I am because I am well aware of what's going on around me, and if I don't know, I'll make a point of going to learn. And I mean, my friends do help me make decisions, but I am in the most part in control. Because I wake up in the morning and I tell myself what to do, and that's a good question. 
There were those who said they hoped they were in control. Who's in control of my life? Salvador. No, that's not true. Um, who's in control of my life? I, I would hope I am. How did I come to believe that? Hmm. Because there's only me at the end. Well, I hope I am. Yeah. Well, I just, had, I just had open heart surgery. So uh, that's uh, a reason to be in control of your life. Me. I make my own choices, she said questioningly. <sighs> that's a hard question. Jeez. I like to think I'm in control of my life. Basically, because I I pay the bills and I make my own decisions about where I'm going to work and that. But the reason, but having to work is not my choice. So there's not a who that's in part in charge, and unless it's me. There were those who said their friends or families were in control. My mom, because she tells me what to do. Do you do what she tells you? Yeah. All right. <laughs> My kids. <laughs> because everything I do, everything I say, everything I, everything I do has to do with them. Everything. My girlfriend's in control of my life. My parents are in control of my life. My animals are in control of my life, and I think my car is in control of my life because they all cost me a lot of money. There was one who said society controlled his life. Who's in control of my life? Oh, I say society's in control of my life because I, well I can control certain aspects but in general I'm led to believe that I have to get a job, I have to grow up and do all these things that are expected of in society now and so that's why I think it dictates what I do with my life. Finally, one suggested no one was in control. No one controls one's life. The elements, society, life itself, depending on whatever you're doing, you're still not in charge. You think you are, but you're not. Just look around you. Would we have all this upheaval? Any decent person would say no. Suppose you are. You're not in charge. UCLA sociologist Harold Garfinkel has related a story about teaching that seemed relevant to our project this week. Not so much because he talks of control as his experience is similar to the one we had, even while posing this question to strangers. Garfinkel assigned his graduate seminar a sociological experiment whereby they would get on a bus with only a few people on it, and instead of sitting in one of the empty seats, they would walk up to someone and ask for their seat. This breaking of a social norm seemed benign enough. However, after three weeks, none of his students had accomplished the assignment, and they complained that it was too difficult. Garfinkel decided to prove to them that it was not difficult. So he had the small class get on the bus at one stop, and then he got on at a later stop and was to perform the experiment in front of them to demonstrate the ease of the assignment. All went well until the moment that Garfinkel had to approach the stranger and ask for the seat. He reports that his palms began to sweat and he felt physically ill as he asked the question. In that moment he realized how truly difficult it is to ask something of a stranger outside the expectations of society. We enjoyed talking to each person who answered our question, but we were also amused as to how much the control of society affected our ability simply to ask the question. We had to overcome our own feelings of impropriety to accomplish this assignment. So while asking about control, we perceived for ourselves how much society controls us.
You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. Poor Little Stephen Gerard by Mark Twain The man lived in Philadelphia who, when young and poor, entered a bank and says he, Please, sir, don't you want a boy? And the stately personage said, No, little boy, I don't want a little boy. The little boy, whose heart was too full for utterance, chewing a piece of licorice stick, He had bought with a scent stolen from his good and pious aunt, with sobs plainly audible, and with great globules of water rolling down his cheeks, glided silently down the marble steps of the bank. Bending his noble form, the bank man dodged behind a door, for he thought the little boy was going to shy a stone at him. But the little boy picked up something and stuck it in his poor but ragged jacket. Come here, little boy. And the little boy did come here. And the bank man said, Lo, what pickest thou up? And he answered and replied, Up in. And the bank man said, Little boy, are you good? And he said he was. And the bank man said, How do you vote? Excuse me, do you go to Sunday school? And he said he did. Then the bank man took down a pen made of pure gold and flowing with pure ink, and he wrote on a piece of paper, S.T. period Peter. And he asked the little boy what it stood for, and he said, Salt Peter. Then the bank man said it meant St. Peter. The little boy said, Oh. Then the bank man took the little boy to his bosom, and the little boy said, Oh, again for he squeezed him. Then the bank man took the little boy into partnership and gave him half the profits and all the capital, and he married the bank man's daughter, and now all he has is all his, and all his own too. My uncle told me this story, and I spent six weeks in picking up pins in front of a bank. I expected the bank man would call me in and say, Little boy, are you good? And I was going to say yes, and when he asked me what S.T. period John stood for, I was going to say Salt John. But the bank man wasn't anxious to have a partner, and I guess the daughter was a son, for one day says he to me, Little boy, what's that you're picking up? Says I, awful meekly, Pins? Says he, Let's see em. And he took em, and I took off my cap, all ready to go in the bank and become a partner, and marry his daughter. But I didn't get an invitation. He said, Those pins belong to the bank, and if I catch you hanging around here anymore, I'll set the dog on you. Then I left, and the mean old fellow kept the pins. Such is life as I find it. Thank you for reading that story to us, and I guess maybe we should explain why the story. Mark Twain, an American author from the 19th century, was lampooning Horatio Alger there. Horatio Alger wrote like hundreds of stories in the yeah 19th century, 1800s is 19th century, right? Uh, basically about how poor boys made good, rags to riches. And his name has become synonymous with this idea that if you work really hard, get a good break, then you will be able to move up the social ladder, so to speak. It's kind of interesting because his stories really weren't that encouraging along that lines. I mean, he's sort of become synonymous with pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. But in truth, his stories really didn't tell that that weren't told that way, right? Now, the usual theme behind a Horatio Alger story was if you were poor, but you worked your head off and you were kind of smart besides, 
then a rich person would find you and take you under his wing. Uh, or pardon me, not would, but might find you, would take you under his wing. There was nothing predestined about it. It wasn't really within your control. It was at the discretion of the rich person. Horatio Alger himself, in one of his stories, said that the majority of the people were doomed to live in squalor and misery. So Horatio Alger himself did not promulgate or indeed believe the Horatio Alger myth, and in fact, he died broke. Did he really? He, he did. died broke. <laughs> Well, gee, cheer up. I'm sorry, but that's kind of ironic. Isn't that ironic? Well, if he hadn't wasted all his time writing these stupid stories, <laughs> and if he found a rich person to suck up to, then by gosh, maybe he would have done better. So... And if you believe that. Twain's story is interesting, though, because it was contemporary to Alger, and um, he seemed to be complaining that Alger was... Well, I don't know. The way I read the story, anyway, you can tell me what your reading of it is. But when I hear, heard the story, I thought that one of the things that Twain was saying to Alger was, not only are rich people not nice people who will help you out if you're good and kind, but if they find out that you're good and kind, they'll take all your pins and sick the dogs on you. <laughs> that they, in fact, far from being uh, generous people who helped out the poor, they were in they were mean spirited people who got rich on the backs of the poor. Your thoughts? You can interpret the story a number of different ways. That's what literature is for. Uh, I'm not sure whether Twain meant to ascribe actual malice to the banker in the story, the uh, the second one, the quote real world close quote banker. But at a minimum he meant to uh, ascribe apathy to him. The bank robber obviously doesn't care about the little boy's ambitions and just runs him off. And just obviously has not read Horatio Alger. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, if you read him, you recognize it as fiction. <laughs> well, I, I think the story is interesting. I think that the Mark Twain story is a nice little find in that it is a kind of deconstruction of the Horatio Alger myth. Um, and I think that the Horatio Alger myth is an interesting thing in light of stuff that has happened in, um, well, not just the United States, but really in the Western world in the last 20 or 30 years. There has been a kind of, of I don't know whether you would call it a resurgence or not, <laughs> of uh, in the individualism. The, um, I guess it maybe started in the 70s with self-help gurus and people thinking about uh, uh, the you are in complete control of your world movement yeah and and not only that but but not only are you in complete control of your world but this kind of um, uh, philosophy that if you just think positively and if you just work hard enough and if you don't let anybody bother you and you know um, think about yourself and yourself alone <laughs> that it will somehow make the world around you better, that there was a kind of um, selfish altruism, that the better that you are to yourself, the better the better the world would be. I think that springs from, well, the obvious source for that is Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And I think the reason that book was as popular as it was is that it allowed rationalization by people who really were out to serve themselves first, last, and always. Yeah, and it was it served their purpose. That is why it was. That is why it, the, the text was taken up, independent of whether it had any validity or veracity. Sure, and it was kind of a misreading of or that any text other words too. Beginning with v. Yeah, the. Um, I mean, I'm thinking now of uh, of the movie Wall Street, which is the classical greed is good movie. He even says that, doesn't he? Michael Douglas, at some point in there, tells well, Charlie Sheen. Greed is good. I know he's telling us a shareholders meeting of I don't know which corporation. Ah. Quote, greed is good, greed works, close quote. Yeah, and so what turn, what started in the 70s is this kind of self-help thing, kind of grew into the 80s into a, um, a full-blown, you know, just get what you want to get kind of thing. And so even... Complete self-absorption, rejection of the public self or the possibility of creating one. Yeah, and rejection of any sense of community. A renewed enthusiasm for violence. Um, yeah, or violent language, anyway. I, I don't want to go so far well, as okay, to say symbolic, people on Wall Street are running around. Case, yeah, a, but, a certain uh, privileging of symbolic violence. Yeah. An admiration not of somebody who could speak intelligently, but of somebody who could say, I'm going to rip off your head and spit down your neck. 
Yeah, and look like they might mean it. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, both Charlie, Charlie Sheen and um, Michael Douglas looked really kind of scary <laughs> in mm -hmm. Wall Street. Well, they're scary. Their persona, scary. their persona was not. I wouldn't be that scared of running into uh, the either. kind banker. <laughs> I wouldn't be too scared of running into either one of them on the street, but I'd be scared to death to run into them on Wall Street. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you. I'd be very sure to cover my assets. <laughs> uh, that was a groaner. <laughs> Well, anyway, so I'm interested in this as a sociologist, and you might be interested in this as a uh, MBA, because I, I think that this is a very good example of how stories get reproduced and replicated and changed in society. And I'm especially interested in the fact that the story of individualism is a changing story. I mean, it seems you like... You mean to say that it changes over time? There's yeah. one version that's taught to one generation version, I don't want to say that is taught, that gains currency within one generation, another revised version that retains currency with the next, and by the time it gets to the third generation, it's sometimes unrecognizable. Yeah, so it's yeah, like the gossip game. You know the gossip game, right? Sure. Where you whisper something to somebody, and they whisper something to somebody else, and so forth. And the first person says what they said, and then the last person says what they said, and it, turned, it, it never is the same thing. It's totally distorted by the end of it. That's kind of what happens, like Horatio Alger gave this one story, and the story has become something else in Wall Street. The story in the 70s of, of self-help became the story of greed in the 80s and, and kind of loss of public self in the 80s. So these things change over time, and they change as they move from person to person and kind of lose. I mean, you might even argue that the story of individualism kind of began with Descartes. And, uh, you know, with Rene Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am. And I'd say you could start the story, oh, probably a earlier, than, earlier that. than that. Yes. With uh, but he, as much ease. But he's credited, at least, with starting this idea of being something separate from God and being something separate from na nature. That, in fact, the rational mind is what makes us separate from divine from supernatural and natural makes us somewhat who we are, that we are human. And that separation from, um, from the world and backing off and becoming, you know, like us and our thoughts is a brand of individualism that really wasn't propagated much before him. You disagree? You have more philosophy than I do, so. Uh. I think that there are any number of, how do I put this, any number of intellectual movements that preceded Descartes, both in Europe and in Asia, that emphasized the individual over society, that basically told the individual, forget about all this societal nonsense, you're really in control of your world. And most of what I know about, I, the qualifier, of course, is that most of what I know about both schools is tainted by the very effect you described, that it's reinterpreted every generation, and then the reinterpretations are reinterpreted until it's been well filtered, to put it politely, to the point where it's unrecognizable. Yeah, so just by virtue of the fact that you've never read ancient Chinese philosophy in the original language, but rather read an English translation of it, could present itself as more individualistic than it was intended. I'm not saying, no, no, we shouldn't extrapolate at all, but I am saying that after it's been photocopied about 47 times, the chances that it will be significantly different from the original are going to be pretty substantial. Use an analogy with which most of us are familiar. Um, and that brings up what I think is a very interesting concept, one that I'm not 100% comfortable with as a sociologist, but it's still an interesting idea that Richard Dawkins put out in the book The Selfish Gene. And uh, I'm just going to read a little quote that I got from him off of the internet. I'm not sure that this is from the book. Do you know this is from the book? I actually don't know. That is Doc those are Dawkins' words. These are Dawkins' words, but not. I don't know whether it's from the book or from him talking about the book. Anyway, examples of means are tunes, ideas, catchphrases, clothes, fashions, ways of making pots or building arches. Just as genes propagate themselves in the gene pool by leading from body to body via sperm or egg, so memes propagate themselves in the meme pool by leaping from brain to brain via a process which, in the broad sense, 
can be called imitation. If a scientist hears or reads about a good idea, he passes it on to his colleagues and students. He mentions it in his articles and lectures. If the idea catches on, it can be said to propagate itself, spreading from brain to brain. Means should be regarded as living structures, not just metaphorically, but technically. When you plant a fertile meme in the mind, you literally parasitize my brain, turning it into a vehicle for the means propagation in just the way that a virus may parasitize the genetic mechanism of a host cell. And this isn't just a way of talking. The meme for, say, belief in life after death is actually realized physically millions of times over as a structure in the nervous systems of people all over the world. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvic.ca. Giving sociology an edge! It makes it sound like the social is kind of biological and it's got a little bit of a deterministic flair to it that I'm not necessarily comfortable with. But I like this idea of ideas take on a life of themselves and that their replication works like genes in the sense that, just like you mentioned the Xerox copy, they get distorted as they get replicated. I think you can model it either way, and I think if you model it simultaneously, it will be good. But what this points out is that ideas drive people just as much as people drive ideas. Yeah. Once I put something in your head, you're stuck with it. You don't have to repeat it. You don't have to say it to anybody else, and you don't have to let it influence your thinking. But there it is. There is the tape recording of it, so to speak. Right. Nonetheless. Maybe it'll go away over time, maybe it won't. But for the moment, there it is. Yeah, no one knows really how memory works, but theoretically, it's in your memory. Mm -hmm. I think it's... The, the genetic analogy amuses me because I've heard often that a chicken is just an egg's way of making another egg, and you can model it that, and, and that <laughs> recalls this model, that people are vehicles for carrying, Dawkins wrote The Selfish Gene, and the, the, as you mentioned, and the theme of that book was that natural selection doesn't work on the level of the individual, of the human being, the human individual, but it does work on the level of the gene that if you look at natural selection as being about genes trying to survive by fitness, then it works very nicely in practice. That's also been observed, I note parenthetically, on the population level. The populations are uh, subject to natural selection. So it's funny, natural selection doesn't work for the organism, but it works for the genes within the organism and the groups that organism forms. Right. And what amuses me here is the idea that people can be driven by ideas that if you look at it, from the other perspective. People often think that they're in control of their actions, they do this and they do that, and, and, and so they are. People have agency. I don't believe in the divine machine model, nor does anybody else, and you can test that belief empirically yeah. and find out that, in fact, they don't when yeah. it comes down to brass tacks. They at least perceive themselves as having some influence over others and over themselves. Sure. They, uh, they do things that... Or else they wouldn't they don't. talk to anybody. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. The well, very fact that we communicate back and forth. If you speak at all, you're trying to influence someone if only by subjecting what you say to their scrutiny. Yes. Unless you're home talking to yourself. But the idea that the the idea is driving people is a more a more valid model, a more consistent model than people driving ideas interests me on a scientific level. I'd like to see if anyone has pursued that clinically or rigorously and see what their results have been. I think it would be wonderfully counterintuitive, and I think it would open up a lot, of, a lot of avenues for future study. I think that although people have free will, what they're going to do is largely influenced by what they think to be the case, by what, by what they hear, by what they observe, by what they, in any particular case, think is immutable, and what, conversely, would respond to their will or their actions. Yes. I think that they must be influenced by it. You're not going to plan a trip to Fiji if you don't know that such a place exists. Yes. And I think that this is also interesting 
if you look at, you know, the idea of trends, the idea of, uh, you know, he, Dawkins mentions fashions and catchphrases and so forth. You and I have a kind of joke between us that we'll share with the people right now. And that is what we call the Howard Jones effect. And the Howard Jones effect is things that are in our brain that we don't know how they got there. And basically, before we met each other in the 1980s, in separate incidents. Wait, that's, that's ambiguous. Oh, okay. We met each other Another, in the in 1990s. 1990s. In the 1980s, before we met, we both had an experience that we shared with each other after we met, in which we were flipping through the television, or, uh, yeah, I guess it was flipping through TV, and we saw a video of Howard Jones and thought to ourselves, that is Howard Jones. We have never listened to Howard Jones' music before in any kind of conscious way. We don't remember ever seeing an interview of him, buying an album by him. We have no idea how we knew what Howard Jones looked like and what his music sounded like, and yet we know we knew it. We have no friends who are especially fond of Howard Jones. We have no friends who indeed have ever mentioned Howard Jones to us, except when we have brought up this phenomenon with them. We don't dislike Howard Jones. We're just sort of amazed that we knew about him without knowing how we knew about him. And there are lots and lots of things that we know about that we don't know how we learned them. They just found their way into our brain some way. One notes passive learning. One notes, for example, that children do not need to be told, today I want to teach you English or French or whatever the language at hand is. One simply speaks in front of them and they understand it. So I think that one of these... Yes, I don't know if you would call that passive. Yeah, you would. Yeah, you would call it's that passive. passive in the sense... I, it's passive in the sense that there isn't a thinking about the thinking that goes on. I hate to use the word unconscious or subconscious because that sort of has a Freudian tone to it that I don't necessarily want to imply here. But in any case, one absorbs. Yeah, there is a kind of mindful learning and there is a kind of mindless learning. And I think that we absorb things mindlessly, frequently. We are bombarded with messages, words, images, and so forth all the time. And I'm sure that the way I learned about Howard Jones is I had been flipping through MTV once before, and it was on, but I wasn't paying attention, but it still got in there. Dawkins' ideas about memes is, is kind of related to that in terms of the idea driving the, the person that ideas sort of have a life of their own. Messages that get repeated in our society, in, in, in the media, in conversations, in interactions with each other, in our relationships at school, in our relationships with our parents, and so forth. These things have a life of their own, and they get into our brains, whether we intend them or are mindful of them or not. And I think that the Horatio Alger myth and looking and tracing kind of how the, in, the idea of the individual taking himself up by his own bootstraps is interesting because the very idea of being an individual is a meme. The construction of the individual as an individual is a meme. Qua individual. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know we're having kind of a postmodern moment here, but, but I think that that that's interesting in and of itself, that here was a story that started out talking about something very social. And as probably I should have mentioned before we get started with the really clever part, that the reason I think that the uh, stories were popular, that the Horatio Alger stories were popular when they were, was that it touched on something in the culture, whether it was simply a need for a palliative or whether it was something that people actually believed and wanted to see reinforced. Some people test their cultural conditioning, and some simply reinforce it, and some do both and some do neither. Yeah. But both, uh, both phenomena exist, both actions exist. So we had this moment in history in which some people were getting very, very rich very, very rapidly. They have the nickname robber barons, in part because by the beginning of the 20th century, these people were regarded as having stolen having taken what they had in some sense or another. And what we have in Horatio Alger is a kind of smoothing over of that, that Alger's stories were the only hope, but it was some glimmer of hope, for the people who were left behind by the robber barons. 
that a generous Rockefeller or a generous Vanderbilt was going to turn around and make it okay for a few poor people. And that made the whole event much more pal palatable, is that the word? Palatable? Yeah. Easier to swallow. I think that the distortion of the Horatio algebra myth occurred over several generations. One generation basically took the myth at face value and said, if you work hard, maybe somebody who is extremely rich will notice and take you under his wing. The next generation said, if you work hard, somebody rich will notice and take you under his, under his wing. The next generation said, if you work hard, you will succeed without regard for the, the method by which one would succeed, the mechanics by which one would succeed. Yeah, the rich person disappears totally from the story at that or, point. Or it's, not, or it's not material, it's generalized. Yeah. The next generation was told, work hard. you just work hard. Yeah. You work hard now. <laughs> and it just totally is lost. And the other 99.9% .9 of the story, indeed the, the point of it, if it ever had a point, is completely gone. Yeah, so here we have this social story that turns into a story of individuals that turns into basically just a pale version of itself. It's, it's become... A caricature of itself. Yeah, a caricature of itself. Will you tell your baked ham story? Yeah, excellent. So, okay, the story of the ham is not a story of the baked ham. It's a story of a fried ham and a frying pan. A mother and a daughter and a grandmother are all in a kitchen together and they're cooking ham for breakfast. And the daughter starts to put the slice of ham into the pan and the mother, her mother says, don't do that, before you do that you need to cut off the ends of the ham. And the daughter looks at this and, and looks at the ham and then turns to her mom and says, but mom, why? And the mom thinks about it for a minute and she's not sure why. So she turns to her mother, the grandmother in the room, and says, why do we do this? And the grandmother said, well, it's just the way I always did it. I don't know why. So she gets on the phone and calls the, the uh, retirement home and gets a hold of her mother, the great-grandmother, and says, why do we cut off the ends of the ham when we put it into the pan? And great-grandma said, well, because my pan was too small. From generation to generation, this pointless activity of cutting the ends of the ham off before you fry it had been passed along without understanding the source of this information and as such daughter after daughter after daughter was pointlessly wasting the ends of the ham without any idea where the source of the, of the information had come from and once they figured it out uh, nobody ever cut the ham off again. So we could call this passive learning or passive culture either way because they each uh, woman in turn picked it up from her mother. Yeah, just by watching. Okay. Yeah, not by actually telling anybody, but just by doing it the way that mom had always done it. I think there's something to be said for passive learning and passive culture. One doesn't want to have to explain to a child before teaching him a language that one is teaching him a language. Sure. And I think it goes quite well the way it, the way it goes already, and I would not like to see it change. But I think we fail to realize that that is how we absorb a great amount of what we, quote, know, close quote. And I think we fail to ask questions, fail to test, and indeed in extreme cases start to insist that quite the opposite is the case, that we're absolutely sure of things that we've acquired in the most haphazard manner. You and I have obviously <coughs> not always known who Howard Jones was. We're sure. older than he is. <laughs> are we? I believe we are. Uh, I guess maybe we would be, yeah. I don't have a problem with how shall I put it, with passive learning and passive culture, I don't think one should have to document everything one knows and then document the documentation and so forth, ending in the obvious, the obvious logical loop that must result because it can't go on indefinitely. Sure, culture I like, is a... I culture, like empiricism. I use empiricism. Culture is a neat invention. It's a neat human invention. And it, it's, I mean, neat in the sense of, you know, neato keen, cool. And the reason it is is because you don't have to get up every morning and reinvent the wheel. Of course. You can rely upon it to let you know what to do in ways that require very little energy on your part. But pursued in extremis, it can become ridiculous. Or assuming that it isn't that are... your, under your control, that it isn't your invention, that it isn't a human invention. Humans thought of it and passed it on from generation to generation. It is possible for humans to think of something new and start passing that along. It begs the question of what an act of will is. I would say that it's not an act of will. I would say that I never set out to find out who Howard Jones was. Sure. 
but nonetheless I found out who he was. One notes things. One has cognition. But we've also transformed Howard Jones in, in that experience into something that never was intended. And by discussing him now, we're passing along the meme, the Howard Jones meme. And we're changing the Howard Jones meme from video star from the mid-80s to social phenomenon. <laughs> the guy you found out about without really wanting to, without really seeking to, and possibly without needing to, but again, we don't dislike this man. We simply note that we didn't intend to find out about him. <laughs> <laughs> so how are we going to sum this up this week? I think that that is what happened with the Horatio Alger myth. People started telling the story and after a generation or two of telling the story they both forgot that it was a story and forgot that stories are not always true. Indeed, they can't be. That's a more subtle point. Yeah. Language space isn't logic space, and if it's not in logic space, you can't apply the, rule, the rules of truth or falsity to it with any rigor. But I think this is a much simpler phenomenon. People simply put things in each other's heads. Dawkins calls them memes. Sometimes I refer to the same seven sentences. Yes. Quote, the same seven sentences, close quote, meaning that people just... That there's a ritual. The, yes, yeah, it's a litany, A ritualized litany that people say without thinking without being mindful, I should say. And passive learning has a certain immediacy and effectiveness to it. It's not completely ineffective. I point to empiricism and say again that I like it and I use it. But one can overdo it. But I think that one of the things that makes a meme stop in its tracks, so to speak, the vaccination against it, as it were, is to name it, to mark it. Sure, when, so you, when you suddenly realize that it's been replicated, when the daughter knew that the whole reason that you cut off the little slice on the end of the ham was because her great-grandmother 50 years earlier had a, a pan that was too small. She no longer had to deal with the ham in the same way. And I think that that's the vaccination against the meme. On, e on any kind of specific meme, I mean, this happens, you can't vaccinate against all memes. You only can vaccinate against each single meme. So, you are in fact a doctor and you can in fact give vaccinations. <laughs> a sociological vaccination. <laughs> Not a medical doctor, but a PhD in sociology, but yes. this is a sort of vaccination that you can certainly give with beneficent effect, potentially. Yes. So, I guess in one way, what we hope to do on this show in the weeks to come is to find these means and uh, vaccinate people against them by calling them by name and examining them. At least once a semester when I was teaching, a student showed up at my office to tell me, you've ruined my life with this sociology stuff. This was not because I assigned astronomical amounts of homework that cut into their party time. Sociology, it seems, made the world a bit uncomfortable because those things that were taken for granted could not be taken for granted anymore. For me personally, the thing that got ruined first was James Bond movies. I could no longer escape without considering the ways in which these movies were constructing women and men and imperialism, ethnicity, violence, war, and even sex. Thinking about these things sort of ruins the whole Bond experience. So when I saw The Matrix a few years ago, I understood the feeling that something was not quite right with the world. The Matrix is the perfect allegory for sociology. I'm aware that deconstructing this movie in this way will probably ruin it as well. So if you loved The Matrix because of the cool special effects and didn't want to give it any thought beyond it has the coolest armed battles in cinema history, then I suggest you tune me out for the next few minutes. Also, if you haven't seen The Matrix, I may ruin a punchline or two here, so consider yourself warned. You listen at your own risk. However, like Morpheus, I invite you to consider an alternative understanding of the movie. I invite you to see the movie behind the movie. What is The Matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. 
No. I don't believe it. It's not possible. I didn't say it would be easy, Neo. I just said it would be the truth. What Neo sees before him is a real world in which robots cultivate human beings like crops and use their bodies as batteries to generate electricity in order to keep the robots working. Human beings are, in fact, the source of the machine. In order to keep humans from knowing their predicament, the machines construct a pretend world, not too perfect, but satisfying enough to keep everyone but the most sensitive amongst us purring along from birth to death, feeding off each other's energy to keep the machine going, even to each individual's detriment. Have you ever stood and stared at it? Marveled at its beauty, its genius? Billions of people just living out their lives. Oblivious. In the mid-1950s, William H. White wrote a sociology classic called The Organization Man, describing the white middle-aged junior executive who left his suburban home, wife, and 2.1 kids every day to be part of the larger corporate enterprise. He blends well with his corporate role and becomes the organization. He does nothing to rock the boat. Instead, the organization man's actions remain consistent with the purpose of the organization and fuel the organization's existence, helping to maintain its status. The copper top human batteries that Morpheus reveals to Neo are the ultimate organizational human beings. They are plugged into the machine most literally. The metaphor of society sucking the energy from human individuals is a dark view of culture indeed, and one that is not unique in cinema history. Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, a 1936 silent classic, depicts Chaplin's tramp as getting caught in a machine, running through the gears smoothly, without control over his fate, and ending up exactly where the machine leads. Chaplin's metaphor was directly influenced by a Marxist understanding of capitalism, an understanding that workers are divorced from their work product and alienated from themselves, becoming, instead of full human beings, a cog in a machine, something we might call a cyborg in this century, both human and machine. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. The Matrix is a more postmodern version of this tale. The cyborgs are virtual characters able to enter the Matrix as machines and able to return to the real, though dismal, world in order to escape the evil machines and battle them to free the human race. But it is a battle for humans who do not want to be freed. The Matrix is a system, Neil. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. It is Neo's coming of age in the story that in fact separates the Matrix from its darker predecessors. The ultimate metaphor in the Matrix is Neo's ability to see the Matrix's true nature. Neo is the one because in the end he can see the Matrix while he is in the Matrix. He no longer believes in its apparent structure nor takes for granted its apparent reality. Instead, his ability to recognize that he is in the machine while he is in the machine enables him to take over the programming from the machines and manipulate its power to his own means. I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. 
I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. Unlike Marxian utopia, based in a class struggle that leads to dissolving of all classes, Neo's subversion of the machine comes from his intimate knowledge of the machine and his ability to see through the illusions of the machine. He is unplugged, and as an unplugged agent in the system, he seeks to unplug others, to provide them with the same knowledge that sets him free. Two basic questions that never quite get answered in sociology are, how much does society influence human behavior, and how much does human behavior influence society? One of the difficulties of these questions is that this thing we call society while well, all around us really doesn't exist in empirical space. When we say society did this or society made that, we generally think we know what we mean. But unlike the matrix and its machine creators, society is something of our own doing. It is our own creation. So in a real sense, the question, how much does society influence human behavior, is a nonsensical question. But it is clear that human beings act collectively, that we influence each other's behavior, and that we often do this with little thought as to the source of our information or as to our motives for our actions. Like the matrix, this construct we call society can limit our actions. The reason, however, that I don't see the matrix as a dark view of human society is that unlike the organization man, the message of the matrix is that the knowledge of the matrix leads to the freedom from the matrix. Neo still has to operate within the structure of the matrix in order to accomplish his goal, but he is an active agent. He asserts influence over the system, but such knowledge will ruin the illusion and that leads me back to my sociology students, uncomfortable in their newfound understanding of the system that is all around them. Such knowledge can lead to a dismal world where Bond movies no longer provide two hours of escape, but rather remind you of all the problems from which you seek escape. But that knowledge can also lead you to a powerful position of influence on the very system that binds you. As Morpheus tells Neo, no one can make that choice for another person. Once the choice is made, however, there is no going back. If you understand the social nature of human activity, the apparent reality of individualism is shattered. Yet the irony is that it is such knowledge that gives the individual more power. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. That's all for this first episode of First Person Plural. We invite you to take the red pill and join us each Thursday at noon here on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia. We can't predict the future, but we believe you'll enjoy learning a little more about the matrix of society each week. Of course, learning about society might not be comfortable, but it can be powerful. We'll see you next week. Why, oh why, didn't I take the blue pill? been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable 
and cfuv.uvic.ca. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. All music for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural, or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com. Thank you.